know anything about Safe Harbor, I would invite you just to get to know us a little bit. And I feel like what we're going to talk about today really are some of the shining stars of the affiliation with UPMC. And that's when people have true passion for their areas of interest and they want to make services better and they're highly energized and they find ways to cooperate. And so our affiliation has really enabled uh, cooperative work in ways that I never really imagined. And I think this is part of it. You know, really finding a new community, finding new opportunities to do things that can definitely change outcomes for what families are struggling. So at Safe Harbor last year, we served about 11,000 people. So I just want you to think about that for a second, because we live in a county, right, where um, we only have, what, 240,000. So that really says something about the number of people who might need some type of support. And the thing that I've learned during my time at Safe Harbor really is that everyone has a story. And I want us to remember that this morning when we start talking, because it's very easy to think that we're talking about someone else's but really, most of us, you know someone where it's been their problem, or it's been your problem, or it's been someone that you love and care very much about who's dealing with addiction, or they're in the grips of feeling suicidal, or they're struggling with depression and they can't get out of bed, or it's a parent where something's desperately wrong with their child and they, have, they don't know where to turn. So we need to, I think, start this morning with understanding that that's all of us. That's not someone else that we're going to talk about. That's everyone in this room, and we need to sort of start coming around these issues like that, or we're not going to get anywhere. We don't get anywhere talking about other people. We get somewhere talking about us. So hopefully you will join me in that as we sort of think about what can we do, not only to combat the opiate situation, but to combat just what happens when families are in the grips of substance abuse. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, at Safe Harbor, we do provide services for mental health, drug and alcohol concerns. We also are a national suicide prevention lifeline center. So we provide a full range of services. But again, I would invite you just to get to know our agency a little bit better because we're, we're, we're yours too. So just like it's your hospital, it's really the community's asset. We want you to share in that and share in our mission. So um, when Moo first asked me to do this presentation, I'm thinking to myself, well, at the last two presentations, one person showed us a little balloon that goes in someone's heart to save their life. Right? <laughs> and then, for those of you that were at the last breakfast, there's like an MRI machine. I have no machines, okay? So, um, I have no machines. And I realized to myself that the um, sort of single greatest challenge that I will face is just standing still long enough to get through this. <laughs> so, um, so, these are our machines, right? The greatest machine on the face of the planet is these guys. It's the human body. So we have to sort of think about when, um, you know, when a little person's coming into the world, they have lots and lots of potential and lots and lots of stuff can, can go wrong, right? And so in my office, sometimes we refer to this right here as baby therapy. Um, because for those of you, has everyone in here held a baby? Oh yeah, right? It's a pretty awesome feeling when things are going well and when things are not going so well, not so much, right? We've all been in that moment where you're like, please take, take this in, right? Because it's tough when things aren't working well with a little person. So we just need to remember this is what we're starting with. And um, so no one at this place chooses addiction, right? So no one enters the world and says, you know what I want to be when I grow up is someone who's dealing with addiction and steals from my mom to feed that habit or prostitutes themselves. No one, no one says that. So I want to introduce you to um, three people that I've had the pleasure of working with in my life. And so the first, the little person with the pigtail, this is a person who, when she entered my working life, she was a mom who had kids of her own. And one of the things that she shared with me during our counseling sessions is that her dad also had dealt with addiction. And so when she was just a, a little one, her dad would take her into town and actually look for windows and houses that were open, and he would pick her up and stick her through the windows so that she could go in, unlock the doors, and let him come into the house so that he could pillage the house to find things to steal to feed his addiction. Is it any wonder that she also later struggled? She faced a lot of very difficult things. The, the little guy with the flowers, so he entered my life, I'm going to say he was about 11 years old, and um, his dad died of addiction. 
and um, he has flowers because this little guy um, used to come to see me for therapy and bring me flowers every time he came. So that's not the image that people think of someone with addiction. It's not someone that shows up every time they see you with flowers, right? The stereotype that doesn't fit that mold. So this little guy found himself though in the grips of, of a pretty difficult situation and didn't make it. He didn't, he didn't live through it. Um, but he didn't choose that. I believe very much in my heart of hearts he did not choose. That was not the path he wanted to be on, but his environment didn't enable him to find a different path out. The little one at the bottom, so this little girl, she's actually a colleague of mine. She's highly successful. And um, this little one, when she was growing up at four and five years old, one of the first things that she learned at home was actually how to clean a pot. So any of you that have survived the 70s might, um, might know that that might mean like filtering out seeds, filtering out stems. She learned how to make the pot that her dad wanted to smoke in the house, like primo, for him to be able to smoke. One of the messages that she got at home was, if you want to try drugs, honey, try them here at home, because then we'll know that they're safe and I can keep an eye on you. So, um, you know, did she really choose that or did something happen in her environment that invited her in, into dealing with a, a difficult situation, right? So I just want to remind us that, you know, where you are today, um, many of us, it's not like we just woke up one day and said, this is where I want to be. Life can take some pretty strange courses. So addiction really has multiple factors. There's this family environment component, and what we know is that the family environment is super important. So I want to take a minute to just kind of blow some stereotypes out of the water. I think what we assume is that the most important thing are the choices people make, you know, whether or not they choose to pick up a drink, they choose to smoke a joint, they choose to use crack. In reality, the thing that actually makes the largest difference for kids is we know this over and over and over again in studies. Even for kids who are born with addiction, the thing that actually will most predict their ability to succeed is what their family environment looks like. And so I think you will hear that from Dr. Walton. Take it from him, he's a doctor. Um, it's true. We want to think about how we really can make a difference. We don't want to get hung up in this idea that if a little person's born with these struggles in their family, we can't do anything because we can't. Actually, in fact, sh shaping that context is one of the easier things that we can do if we take the appropriate steps to try to do so. So there's this family history and genetics piece, there's the family environment piece, and then there's like wider social issues. So I'm guessing everyone in this room, you've been out where somebody said, oh, come on, just have one more. Well, that sounds terrible, let's go get a drink, right? I mean, we live in a culture that promotes the use of substances to deal with our problems, and we're shopping, right? Like things that um, get our dopamine going. And for um, women especially, there's a very strong link between trauma and substance use. So I want you to appreciate that, that for a lot of people, the path to substance use actually comes through horrible traumatic events that happen to them. And using drugs and alcohol is a way to numb that. And then rinse and repeat. Because when you use drugs and alcohol and you finally get to a place that you're addicted, there's a lot of shame that goes along with that. And there's a lot of shame that goes along with trauma. So when a person's really struggling with something awful that they went through, and they numb that, and they have then consciousness of that, it's so awful to be in that place. Most people with addiction will tell you that they struggle with wanting to die, they hate themselves, they hate the addiction. It's, it's not a choice that people are really making in the way that we might choose where we're going to go on vacation. So what happens? What is, why does that happen? Um, what we know is that there's a lot of debate about what causes addiction. So if you want to have a riveting discussion about this, by the way, you should see Jesse Monte or why Jesse wave your hand. So Jesse's our clinical supervisor. She and I can sit for about 45 minutes and have this discussion several times a week. We don't really know. The bottom line is we don't really know. There are like multiple theoretical orientations as to what really causes addiction. We can tell you certain things pretty factually. So drugs absolutely impede your brain's ability to think clearly. Again, everyone in this room knows that. If you've had any experience with using an illicit substance, you know that it changes your ability to think. Drugs also tend to create higher than average levels of dopamine. So essentially dopamine is the thing that you're like, yes, woo, it's the, it's like, it's a feel good, and it's also the I feel better if something's happened to me type of hormone. So when drugs give us unusually high levels of dopamine, what is tricky about that and why people get those cravings is because your 
your body then like misses it and you can't recreate that with other things. So if you talk to someone who has addiction, they often, you know, they will tell you that they, they don't feel anything, they feel numb, it's hard to get their emotions back. And that's in part because their emotions also have been dramatically altered. And so we need to think then what that means is the person's suffering. When they don't have the substance, they are suffering. And when we're kind about it, we refer to that as things like depression, <coughs> sadness, when we use our compassionate way of thinking. When we talk about addiction, we often we're like, oh, that's yeah, that person. They, they made a bad choice, right? Well, they're suffering. It's physically uncomfortable. It's emotionally and cognitively uncomfortable. And I can't think of any other illness where we would think, well, you're suffering, you should like work that out. You need to go, you need to feel the pain of your heart attack to really know that you should change your diet. No one would say that, right? But our approach is so different with addiction. So the other thing is that we do know that over time, um, drugs and alcohol can change the structure of your brain, but I would also just encourage you to remember that um, those are more, tend to be more extreme situations. The brain has a lot more plasticity than people really realize. We um, tend to sort of want to throw in the towel long before our body actually does. We can regain a tremendous amount of functioning, especially when we talk about the little ones that we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to give you a little analogy. Has anyone in here ever been to the grocery store when you're hungry? Okay, yes. So, and um, so you haven't eaten all day, right? You're driving home, you're thinking like, man, i got to eat, or you're feeling funny, you know, your body's telling you it needs help. And so then you stop by Wegmans, right, just to pick something. Something weird ends up there, right? You're like, oh, I, I needed a tin of Vermont syrup. I needed that. And you get home and you're like, this syrup costs $24. Well, I do. So um, that's because we don't make good decisions when we're not feeling well physically. And so this is, you can all relate to these experiences, right? This is the same thing that when you're on a diet and you go home and you're ravenous and there's like a salad or a thing of Oreos, right? People tend to go to what's easy. So, um, and you've all seen the commercials where um, we need Snickers, and there's like the nice little lady that turns into General Patton because she's hungry. Um, so that, there's actually like language for this in the um, field of addiction. It just reminds us that anytime you know, you're like hungry, angry, lonely, tired, you're not at your best, you're probably not gonna make great decisions. So you can all relate to this. So on the next slide, what I'm just gonna show you is what this more looks like from an addiction. Perspective. So this is that the dopamine craving and not having adequate dopamine in your body, just you're suffering, you're wanting that experience that sometimes we call a high, right? And so is it any wonder then that we make very bad decisions? So you think you make bad decisions when you're hungry at Wegmans? What kind of decisions would you make if you're in the desert and you haven't had a drink, you haven't had food? How desperate might you be? That's the level of intensity we're really talking about. Things that most of us, unless we've really been there, we don't actually understand because we haven't had that profound of an experience on our bodies before. So um, I wanted to give you just something I suppose that you could relate to a little bit because it's, again, too easy to judge. So where are we at now? We know that overdose is actually the leading cause of death for those under 50 for the first time since Vietnam. The um, average age of a young white male has actually declined. I mean, we know that there's like a generation really in trouble here. We're finding difficulty with a labor market. I mean, so if you don't care about this from a sort of emotional standpoint, I encourage you to think about it just from an economic standpoint. It is awfully expensive. My um, little guy that I shared with you from the first little flower guy. Um, so his dad died of addiction, had to have an autopsy, had to have very expensive and extensive testing through the coroner's office. Um, his dad was involved in the criminal justice system, cha-ching, right? His mom ended up being in a shelter in a situation. Kids all ended up needing an intense level of services where he's adding it up. And um, the, this little person, when he finally ended his own life, you can think of that as that cost each community about $1 million. The cost of a suicide is around $1 million for each one. So start really thinking about what is the economic impact maybe for just one family. Um, and what we could do, suicide is preventable, addiction is preventable. These outcomes are things that we can act upon if we come together to do so. So that leads me to my point that I've covered.
recovery is a real thing. And um, every time I hear about the opiate crisis, I just think, oh my gosh, can someone please talk about the answers that we have out there? Because there are evidence-based treatments to deal with addiction if we can connect people. And one problem that we have is capacity. We have a problem connecting people to treatment. Recovery is really a real thing. And I, I need you to believe that because the data is there. So the data is there that people can get better. It's a process. People relapse. And that's part of the process. Just like for someone that has diabetes, we don't expect that they're gonna go see their endocrinologist and never have a problem again. That's just not how that's not how these things work, right? So we have to expect it will be a struggle, but people can get there. We know that about one in ten adult Americans endorse the idea that they're in recovery. They don't tell you. People don't tell you that they're in recovery because we have made it so uncomfortable to talk about addiction. You don't hear it, but you need to. People are in recovery, and it's possible, so we need to get behind projects that actually can help us get there. So that leads us to talking about today's project. Julie, this is the best part, really. So um, what we're looking to do is the Pregnancy Recovery Center, which will be a collaborative effort between the State Harbor and UPMC Hammond that really looks at having a multi-generational impact. Because we know that addiction and family stuff, so to speak, they work together. And so by helping a mom and helping a new family at a quite pivotal time, we're increasing the odds that that little person is going to have a better life experience. We want to like change the game there for what the family might be dealing with by providing a lot of support. We're modeling this program after an evidence-based project that's at Mickey Women's in Pittsburgh. And we're looking to create community-based options. So one of the things that's very exciting about our project is that instead of having a philosophy that people must always come to us, we will have a philosophy where we have a mobile component where we go to the community to do more outreach, to find people, to make it okay to get treatment if they want it. And then if the main barrier is just walking through the door, to have a person that will walk side by side with you through the door who is not judging and who is encouraging and who will sort of be there leading up through the pregnancy, through the birth, and then, um, again, if you've ever had a baby, <laughs> it's not easy, right? It's a really stressful time. So we need to make sure that those, like zero to three, we're really setting the family up for a high level of success. The other thing about our project that I find um, just wonderful and I'm super excited about is that instead of just focusing on opiates, we plan to focus on any type of addiction that could be a detriment to the developing child. So many people might not know, for instance, there's a big connection between smoking when you're pregnant and the development of ADHD. We hear a lot about like low birth weight, not so much about the mental health stuff. So um, think about that. You know, think about our ability to maybe make some changes, long-term changes for mental health for children, um, and then again for their families. So we're super excited about our ability to do that. So what are the components? Let's talk a little bit about what actually will be happening. So we're very lucky to be working with the OBGYN practice. Everyone's heard about this, right? That UPMC Hammond has this wonderful new practice. So the practice is going to be providing medication-assisted treatment, which will be in the form of Subutex, which is a special medication for women who are pregnant to help them to come off of whatever the opiate is that they're using and maintain them throughout the pregnancy in a way that's safer for the child, and then sort of look at what the treatment options are. There will also be a nurse education and data collection element to this. We're very excited actually to try to streamline some of the data collection and learn a little bit more about um, who's kind of coming in the door at the hospital, get a better sense of what those outcomes are, and really contribute to the research and the evidence base of what actually works for these women and families. We're excited to join the Pittsburgh team in that effort. And then, of course, there will be the community outreach that I spoke about and a lot of nursing support. This will be partnered with Safe Harbor's <laughs> existing program. So as was alluded to, we have a warm handoff program where if someone comes into the hospital, they've had a medical emergency related to addiction, we meet with them, we provide an assessment, and we get them connected to treatment. Other myths, people think folks with addiction don't want help, right? Like, oh, they're just, if they wanted help, they'd get it. Okay, so in the month of May, 100% of the people that we touched with our warm handoff program went into treatment. 
hundred percent. Jesse, do you remember how many people that was? Fourteen. So every person that we saw got connected to treatment. We can't go around perpetuating a myth that people don't want help or they'll get help when they're ready. So we'll partner with the Warm Hand Off program. We'll also provide outpatient therapy, counseling support for women and their children. And then again, the mobile case management piece that will reach people out in their community to try to better engage so that we can do something about people that want help and they're just not sure what to do. So this leads me to the place where I say, okay, you guys want to help? Do you want to help? And sort of what can the average person do to support this? So the first thing is just changing the conversation. You know, hopefully you picked up a lot of my thread today was really about can we talk differently about addiction? Can we talk about recovery? Can we talk about opportunity? Can we change the blame language that we use for people who are dealing with addiction? That is probably the single most important thing any one of you can do is talk about our program and talk about it in a way that promotes dignity and respect because when someone feels respected and they feel safe, they will engage and that's what we want. We want people to know that we're a safe place to get help. Learn more about this, spread information, you know, find ways to talk about it. If you work for a large corporation, please find a way to talk about it at work because guess what? Addiction is one of the things that hijacks productivity at work. There are logical ways to have this conversation in so many areas. I'd be glad to talk with you about that. I'd be glad to talk to you about getting speakers for churches, businesses, any place we can talk about this. Let's talk about it, but instead of talking crisis, let's talk about what we can do about it. And then, you know, give up your money, give up your time. So as with any project, we do need support to make it work. So you know, obviously we need things like financial support, but we, we also need volunteers. We need people that are just interested in helping, interested in having a conversation, and we would be so glad to just talk with you about what some of those opportunities are. So I think I got the best part. <laughs> Um, so I'm very excited, I just, it probably shows, right, um, about the project and again, just feel like this is one of the things that I would highlight about the collaborative things that happen in our community and that we should be so proud to be a part of. Um, so I now have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Wilson. I should make you stand up here like David made me stand up. That was fun. Come on, Dr. Wilson. <laughs>
can't say anything else before I say thank you. The, it's overwhelming, the support in this room for Children's Care Fund and the past history of help as far as the neonatal intensive care unit. And believe it or not, we do remember <laughs> where the support comes from. What I want to do is walk you through, and just a little, hopefully quickly, um, but give you a rationale based on local data for why this program that Mandy has laid out is so important. So what we're talking about here is a 24-bed level 3 neonatal unit uphill. And we do work very closely with the University of Pittsburgh Division of New Board Medicine. And I'm going to talk to you about data that we developed here locally in 2013. This is in our community that talks about a little bit about neonatal abstinence syndrome. In other words, drug withdrawal for babies that were so that affected to the point where they needed neonatal intensive care. And it's been 15 to 20 percent of the admissions to the neonatal intensive care unit We have an un really unfortunate natural experiment in that there was a contract to provide obstetrical services to the State Correctional Institution in Cambridge Springs, Pennsylvania. Now think about that. A mom is incarcerated. Why are women incarcerated? It's drugs. By far and away. They're in a, 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 an institution. They come here, they deliver their babies, and they go back to prison. Their family lives in Scranton. What does that mean for the baby after they left? Let's see if we can figure out the slides here. That's a great question. Maybe help me. <laughs> How do I advance them? So we recognized, obviously, that we had a situation in which not only within the community, but also within the obstetrical population that we were serving, that we needed to do some things. So we had an antenatal council. It's not like we're starting from scratch here. We're already doing many things, and yet still we have this big problem. So we had an antenatal consult program where whenever possible, we would meet with a mother beforehand. That wasn't possible if she was incarcerated, obviously. But if it was possible and someone sought help, we had an antenatal consult program. We had patient education pamphlets and more nursery observation and screening, trained very carefully the nurses to do what's called a modified Finnegan scoring to find out how significant particular baby's signs of withdrawal might be. And then we had non-pharmacologic and pharmacotherapy. In other words, we would give these babies morphine in order to control the signs of withdrawal, in addition to doing some of the other swaddling and care practices that we needed to do. So we had case management and some social service involvement, and the Office of Children and Youth, by law, we were required to let them know that we had a child that was exposed to a potentially deleterious substance during pregnancy. And we do the developmental follow-up. Even with all of that, we still have some issues. So what I want to show you here is that the neurodevelopmental outcomes and hospital length of stay, that's a simple thing that I can test. How long is a baby in the hospital? I think it's very important to understand that appropriate maternal infant interactions um, have been shown in the literature to, to link to outcomes, long-term outcomes. I think Manny mentioned it. The single best predictor of outcome for a baby, for a baby in general, but particularly for a baby that's been exposed to potentially noxious substances, is rearing. It's the, the, there is very limited data to indicate that there's a direct ter teratological effect, in other words, 
structural change in the brain. These children are not damaged for life. We can make a difference. That's the take home message. Um, often people say, well, you know, there's nothing we can do. But that's not the case. There's good evidence to indicate that it's, it's the rearing of these individuals that's the most important in terms of long-term outcome. So what do we have? We had incarcerated mothers that are not available to provide optimal non-pharmacological uh, uh, intervention for their infants. They're not there to hold them, to cuddle them, to swaddle them, to sing to them, to read to them, to do the things that we would want them to do. And this was back in the early 2013. And we had essentially a control group when compared to infants receiving both non-pharmacologic care, all of those things that we talked about in terms of cuddling, swaddling, speaking, singing to them, all of the things that mothers naturally do for their children, but they're not there. So there were variations both in the antenatal medications that uh, moms were getting for um, problems in terms of opiate issues. And I think, as Mandy mentioned, we now have a group of docs that are willing to use Subutex rather than methadone. There are differences in terms of the drugs. And they have potential implications for the optimal care of these kinds of infants, which is just a subset of all of the children in the community that are exposed to these medications. So let's look at it. This is a very simple slide in some ways. It talks about length of stay. So length of stay for children who had to be admitted to the neonatal unit because they had significant troubles in terms of withdrawal. Again, this is only a subset. So for all of the admissions, we were talking about over 20 days of neonatal intensive care okay, for the moms that were, got methadone and were incarcerated, the average was almost 35 days, 34. For those moms that had methadone but were in our community and therefore available to be with their babies after delivery, you can see that they had almost uh, between 20 and 25 days. For all, everyone who was not incarcerated, they did much better. And the best outcomes were a combination of being available and using Subutex, which is the last bar, that bright blue bar at the very end. Those were the children that did the best. What Mandy's program that she just told you about is really based on two big things from my perspective. It's the support of the family, both before and after delivery and the appropriate medical care, including pharmacologic care, to optimize the outcomes. What we want is to minimize this. So how many people are we talking about? This, unfortunately, is the admissions just for treatment of neonatal abstinence syndrome, what I didn't show you here. These are just kids that get into the unit. That means one a day, one a week, right now, in our community, is being hospitalized for neonatal intensive care over 20 days of NICU care once a week within our own community, and it hasn't gotten any better. Um, that's why this program is so important in terms of the outcome. So as a, as a, as a spouse, as a father, as a member of the uh, medical community, and as a member of this community, I really do applaud your uh, input and your help in terms of trying to get this program off the ground. Because if this was a simple problem, we would have solved it a long time ago. This is data from back in 2013. And we've done a lot, but there's still a long ways to go. 